We are joined live in Hawaii by Barry Choi, who is a hurricane hunter. So for over 30 years, he has worked at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in a variety of jobs, ranging from diver to ship operator, weather forecaster, and more. But what you guys are here today to hear about is his job as a hurricane hunter. So while the rest of us are, are cowering and running away and, and trying to hide from hurricanes, Barry flies planes directly into the hurricane so that we can get a better understanding of their nature and save lives down the road. So without further ado, Thank you so, so much for joining us, Barry, and take it away. Aloha, everyone from Hawaii. And uh, I know I can't hear you, but uh, what I'll do is um, we'll go through a real sh real brief presentation here, and I'll allow you some uh, an opportunity to ask some questions. And so we'll get started here. What's that? No, the whole restart thing. Oh, am I restart in the middle the of this thing? The job of a hurricane hunter oh, yeah. is not for the painted heart. These brave men and women must fly straight into one of the most destructive forces in nature. Hurricanes are born over the open ocean. And while satellites can track their movement, meteorologists and researchers need to sample the storms directly to get the most accurate information about them. NOAA's Hurricane Hunter fleet includes two P-3 turboprop aircraft, as well as a Gulfstream 4 jet. The P-3s fly in the storm, encountering devastating winds that can be over 150 miles per hour. The jet can fly higher than the turboprops, gathering data from the upper atmosphere. Both planes have high-tech equipment on board to get the job done, like radar and fixed probes that measure particles in the air. Scientists also deploy drop wing sonics, which parachute down through the hurricane to the ocean surface, sending back data on pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind. These measurements can help us understand the structure of the storm and the winds that are steering it. The data is used in computer models to help forecasters predict how intense the hurricane will be and where and when it will strike land. Hurricane hunters take a literal look into the eye of a monster formed by nature. Their courage helps further science, which saves lives. Well, while that video pretty much detailed what we do when we go out there and fly into hurricanes, I'll give you a little bit more of an overview of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and also uh, what we specifically do as we fly into the, the storms and, and what it's used for. Uh, NOAA is a, a science-based service organization. Our mission is science, service, and stewardship, the science piece. We're trying to understand what goes on our planet, you know, the uh, atmosphere, the oceans, the climate, and uh, how those, uh, how the atmosphere and ocean works together. And if we can understand that, we can model it and provide predictions. Now, the service piece is if we know that and we can predict changes, uh, what do we do with that? We share it with others through various means, and I'm going to share you with some share some information with you today. And that stewardship piece, if we see some of these train wrecks coming, the sea level's rising, the, the planet's warming, what do you actually do about it? Um, our fisheries are collapsing. How do we uh, protect those resources so it's sustainable for the future? Uh, NOAA uh, has a number of line offices, and there's just offices within the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. The two we're going to concentrate on uh, today are the National Weather Service and the Office of Atmospheric Research. Uh, also, the Office of Marine and Aviation and Operations is, is where I work, and we operate the ship and the aircraft assets for NOAA. Within the o OMAO, as you see there, Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, there's a small group of commissioned officers like the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. There's the NOAA Corps. And uh, we are commission officers, just like all the other branches of service. And uh, we run the ship and the aircraft uh, for NOAA. There's a number of other line offices, as you can see there, our Environmental Satellites Information Service, our Ocean Service, and our Fishery Service. But we won't touch too much on that uh, this, this morning here and afternoon where you're at. So here to talk about hurricanes. 
Uh, this is a very uh, nice graphic someone prepared uh, from the 2005 season. And what you'll notice there are that hurricanes can be uh, strong and small or weak and large. And, you know, you can see the different sizes of the storms. This is a mosaic of multiple storms all placed uh, on one map uh, after the hurricane season. And you can see we've got some pretty small storms here like Emily, but uh, very intense, as you can see by that eye, that eye structure uh, when it's really defined like that characterizes a very strong storm. And then you can see Katrina, which is a relatively large storm. It takes up almost the entire uh, Gulf of Mexico there. Uh, storms are categorized by wind speed. However, as you'll see in a minute, most of the damage and most of the lives lost are not uh, directly from the wind, but the impacts of wind on the ocean and, and the rainfall. Uh, this is just uh, uh, a um, chart on all the different wind speeds. On the left, you'll see the uh, miles per hour. Uh, category three and higher is called a, a major hurricane. And uh, you have really significant damage with, with those storms above the three. Of course, flooding is a big issue. This is from Katrina down in uh, New Orleans. You can see uh, some of the flooding issues that are experienced. Almost 80% of the lives lost are typically due to drowning and flooding. Uh, storm surge is another big um, hazard from these storms. You'll see this large ship that was in a shipyard there on uh, just put right up on shore. This is a, you know, a several hundred ton ship just placed on shore. These are the uh, casinos after Katrina on, uh, on the uh, coast of um, the Gulf of Mexico and Biloxi. This casino here, if you look in the bottom of the screen, that little square, you'll see there's a, a pirate ship. It was sort of a pirate ship uh, casino. And uh, yeah, while the building looks like it's intact, if you notice right here, the first couple floors, the storm surge was so strong, it blew right through the building and you would see all this debris back in here and it cleared the parking lot out of any trees or anything that was in there. And so while some of these buildings look like they're intact, they're, they have sustained a lot of damage. Um, here's another casino in that Biloxi area. And, and uh, you get the idea that, that these storms are quite devastating. One thing that I wasn't expecting is when I flew over Lake Pontchartrain after, the, after Katrina, uh, this road that goes across the, the lake here, I was surprised that those concrete uh, sections of the road were all lifted up. It almost looked like dominoes. Uh, and so the, um, the water is very powerful and it can cause a lot of damage. And so why do we take uh, 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 these planes into hurricanes? One is better forecast saves lives, and that's the number one reason we do it. Uh, evacuations are quite costly and disruptive. As you can imagine, if we can limit that evacuation area, we save a lot of money and a lot of consternation for the folks who live there. Uh, and it's essential for our uh, numerical prediction models. And that's the tool that our forecasters use to better predict the track, the intensity of the storm. We wanna know where this thing is going, when it's gonna get there, how large it is, and how strong it's gonna be. Uh, we also, to be able to prepare better and uh, provide better predictions, is we have to understand the structure of these storms, so we fly into them. This is just an example, uh, back in 2003, if we were warning for this particular storm, and we did, uh, how much of the coast would have to be warned. And as our predictions have gotten better over the years, we did the same calculation in 2010, and we were able to narrow that to a, a much smaller area. So you can see uh, using aircraft observations and all kinds of observations beside aircraft and the prediction models that we have today and the, and the skillful forecasters really improve that prediction. This is a hurricane. If we took it and we cut it in half, uh, took a cross section down it, you'll see that eye structure in the center. Um, that eye forms because there's sinking air in that location. And then you'll see a number of, of these rain bands uh, that extend out from the eye, sometimes uh, over 100 miles. And uh, as we fly into the storm, we have to go through these successive rain bands. And that's typically where you have a lot of really bad weather. And then in this eye wall is typically where you have the, the strongest um, uh, convection, we call it, or the thunderstorms. This is a tail Doppler radar shot. The aircraft is right here in the middle of the storm. And you can see these towers of thunderstorms in the eye wall extend up to 50,000 feet. Here's a graphic uh, presentation of a cross section of a storm. And you can see um, how that um, 
how that rainfall forms within the storm and where it's at in, in the core and elsewhere in that storm. What we'll look at here is an animation of Hurricane Katrina and, and what you wanna look at uh, carefully is watch as that storm proceeds, watch behind it, this warm colors are uh, warm water and you see it actually cools the water behind it. What happens is a storm moves over the warm water. If, it, if, if there isn't a really uh, deep mixed layer, it upwells cold, cooler water and it can weaken the storm. And we actually flew ahead of uh, Katrina and dropped some, some uh, uh, sons. They call them um, uh, AXBTs, Airborne Expendable Bathy Thermograph uh, buoys, to, to look at the water column and see how, um, how deep that mixed warm layer of water was. And, we, uh, and the forecasters forecasted the storm to weaken, which it actually did as we were flying it off store, offshore. It was a category five storm. And we'll see that in a sec. This is what it might look like as we fly uh, toward a storm. Um, it's pretty uneventful, except you can see where it's at. You see uh, a lot of uh, lightning there in the distance and we're headed out to the storm. And uh, that's typically what we see from our, our office view in the cockpit as we head toward a storm. Tell you a little bit about the tracks that we fly. Uh, two different types of aircraft, as you saw in the video. The P3 flies that blue track, sort of a crisscross through the storm, as you can see there. And then the red track is what the G4, the high altitude jet, will fly. And these are what those uh, aircraft look like. So the P3 flies down and in the storm. The uh, G4 flies around the storm. You can think of the storm as a, a cork in a river. Uh, there's, a, there's an atmospheric um, uh, influence to that storm that actually moves it in various directions. So you really have to know that environment that that storm is in. The upper level wind flow can actually affect where that storm is going. So we measure that with the, uh, the G4 aircraft. Here's what the aircraft looks like and some of the features You'll see on the belly, uh, there's a, a radar dome, the C-band fuselage radar. We call that the big M&M on the bottom of the plane. And that can look out around the aircraft, as you see in these lower, Im the lower images here, uh, the belly radar on the bottom left. And that's what you would see from inside the aircraft. You can see the eye wall structure and all the rain bands as you head out. That tail Doppler radar on, on above, as you've seen, it can do a cross section of the storm. And and that same image uh, that we showed earlier is on the top right corner there. We also use drop wind sounds. And you probably heard of weather balloons. We launch weather balloons to see what's happening in the upper atmosphere. And that information goes into our, our models as well to help the forecasters provide a better prediction. Well, in a storm, we can't really launch weather balloons from the aircraft. So what we do is we do it uh, in, in the opposite direction. We drop a sun with a little parachute on it. And as it's falling, it collects wind speed, wind direction, uh, humidity, temperature type information. And here's one being launched out of the aircraft so you can see what it actually looks like. Uh, drops on operator there, puts it in the tube. And uh, we have a little valve uh, in this area right here and the aircraft is pressurized. So the pressure, uh, air pressure in the aircraft is higher than outside. So we open that valve and uh, that it shoots the sound out of the aircraft. And um, we can see what that looks like when it comes out of the aircraft. And you'll notice in this section right here, watch very carefully because it's really small. In a, in a few seconds here, you'll see it pop out of the aircraft right in this lower few, there, there it went. So hopefully you were able to catch that and your classrooms have enough bandwidth that the videos are playing at the, the same speed where we're playing them here. Now, why do we do this? Here, here this is Katrina and uh, this is the best track. The actual track that the storm made was in black. Uh, the forecasters predicted it to go along this track here in green. And if we didn't put any of those drop sounds in, uh, this is what they would have predicted. So you can have a quite a big difference in your forecast skill just by using those sounds alone. We'll look at Katrina a little bit. Uh, this is a belly uh, radar um, image of our eye wall replacement cycle, which is kind of neat because you have two eyes. And who would have thought that these storms, as they go through these replacement cycles, actually have an eye within an eye, which you don't typically see on your television. So your newscasters are sharing some of that no information with you. From the cockpit, uh, we have a, a radar that we can look at the storm as we head into it. And this is what it looks like. This is the eye right here, the eye wall itself. This is the eye, the black part. And the aircraft would be located right here, headed into the eye. 
And you can see it's a little offset to the right. What's happening is the wind speeds are really strong in this direction. So we have to kind of turn the aircraft to the left a little bit here to adjust for the wind so that we go right into the center of the eye. That's what you would look like if you were in the center of the eye and you look at, here's the eye wall from the center of the eye. And, and to give you an example, this is what the aircraft um, um, operators, your airline pilots have this similar radar and they only fly in the green. They stay away from the yellow and the red and that's what we fly into. And, and now what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you what it's like to fly into the storm. We're right at the edge of the eye wall of Katrina right here. Uh, that's the eye itself, that black part. And we're going to head into the eye wall, which is the most intense part of the storm. And you're going to see it start getting pretty bumpy. Uh, the co-pilots on the right, the pilots on the left, and this person in the middle here with the white gloves is the flight engineer. So it takes three of us to really operate this plane. Uh, the pilot and co-pilot are taking turns at flying the plane into the storm. Well, one backs the other one up in case something happens and they have to take over. Um, these are your engine instruments in the center panel here. Uh, some of your environmental instruments on the overhead. The flight engineer is maintaining the, the power settings because we have to fly at a, a specific speed. If we go too fast and we get bounced around too much, you can actually cause cracks in the wings and, uh, and damage the aircraft. And if we go too slow, we can have aerodynamic stall or engine stall. And uh, that, is, uh, that is not good as well. So in a little bit, we're gonna fly through this uh, eye wall and into the eye itself. As you can see, nothing you can see nothing out the windows because the rainfall is so intense. And you can see you bounce around quite a bit. As it clears out a little bit, you're gonna see a little probe here. We have instruments on our probe. You're gonna see that start up here that sticks out about 10 feet in front of the aircraft. And then you're gonna see uh, that beautiful uh, eye structure. We call it the stadium effect where um, the clouds slope up to, you know, say 50,000 feet all around you. And uh, this video doesn't do it justice, but it's, it's a really magnificent site, magnificent site. And you can see all the way, typically all the way to the surface of the water and, um, and all the way up um, out of the, uh, the eye of the aircraft. And you're gonna see what that looks like right there. You can see that sloping cloud uh, structure up to higher levels. And in the eye, the winds are calm and they go to zero pretty much. And, and so we can let people up and let them walk around. And then we set the seatbelt sign up again and people sit down and we'll go right back out the other side of the storm uh, to measure the, um, the other side of the eye wall. And so I'll, I'll let this run for just a, a second more because I think there's a really good shot of the eye. And then uh, we'll go and wrap up and I'll let you ask some, some questions in case I didn't cover uh, uh, something that you were interested in. We do sustain a little bit of damage. Rainfall itself, uh, where's the paint off the plane? It's like sandpaper or sandblasting. If we get into hail or uh, grapple, uh, it can actually make small holes in the leading edges of the wings and we have to patch those before we go out. Occasionally we have some major problems. This was in Hurricane Hugo. Our crew actually lost two engines and uh, it really turned the cabin ups upside down a lot and uh, a lot of things broke loose and we almost lost that aircraft. So it's not um, um, completely safe, but we do it. Uh, because it saves lives. Uh, we are, we're also experimenting now with unmanned aircraft to take the place of the G4 or uh, perhaps someday take the place of the G4. This is the Global Hawk. It flies at a really high altitude and it can it handle that surveillance mission the G4 does flying around the storms. We've even flown one of these over a storm, but it was less than a Cat 3 level storm. We also have these small uh, UAVs. There's unmanned aircraft that we can launch from the P3, that they can fly down low in the eye of the storm. This is the Coyote. And uh, we've launched a few of these. Uh, they're quite expensive and we don't get them back. They're about $30,000 a piece. So we don't launch too many of those. And uh, with that, I just wanted to share a little tool with you that, that NOAA has. If you wanted to go and look up hurricanes, uh, the historic hurricanes that have occurred anywhere, uh, go to this tool. And I think the website is on the bottom there and you can go and, and click on these uh, hurricanes and, and, and tropical weather systems, and they'll tell you when they occurred and, and uh, where they uh, impacted. That's my contact information. Feel free uh, to take that down, and, and uh, please email me if there are questions I haven't asked.